welcome back from lunch. I hope you were able to find good accommodations. Um, I'm just going to introduce our, our presenter, uh, Russ Taylor. He's an associate librarian at the Brigham Young Lee Library, and he has about 25 years experience in, in that field. He's also worked as a corporate speech writer. Um, he got his undergraduate degree in history and then a law degree following that. Uh, also, he has worked as a bullwhacker and an ox drover. Maybe he can tell us more about that, but uh, he's, he's done that at the Oliver Kelly Historic Farm and Ely River, Minnesota, and also this is the place monument in Salt Lake City. So I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Russ. Thank you. Well, Jed, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the use of your computer to, to uh, run this PowerPoint. So I, I worked as a a librarian for three years at BYU and then I decided that wasn't exciting enough so I went to law school and I after my first year I, I told my wife this is the stupidest thing I've ever done uh, she says well too bad buddy you moved us across the country so you're gonna stick with it so when I graduated with a law degree I, I didn't want to practice and I ended up um, working for the FBI and becoming a speechwriter for the director and so I spent about 15 years working as a speechwriter for various organizations and it was, uh, it was fun to move around the country, but my last job uh, was restructured and I wasn't part of the structure, so I had an opportunity to think about what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And I decided I wanted to be a librarian again. And um, while I was working some part-time library jobs, I worked for the Minnesota State Historical Society and I worked on a living history farm. And we drove oxen and plowed with oxen and hauled hay and straw with oxen, and it was like living in the 1850s, uh, wearing canvas uh, sailcloth pants and wool shirt, uh, uh, vests, and boy, in the blazing sun, that was an ordeal, but uh, I got a taste for what it was like to live in the middle of the 18th century, or 19th century, and it was a, it was a revelation to me. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my association uh, with the partridges. Um, on the slide, uh, that's an image of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, um, about 1850 or so. Um, so you get a sense for Pittsfield. How many of you are Edward Partridge descendants? Okay, quite, quite a, fun, a bunch of you. I had the opportunity to speak at a, um, to a group of people associated with the Bidwell House Museum, which is, um, the Bidwell House is the home of Edward Partridge's grandparents. And it still stands in Tiringham, Massachusetts. It's a museum you can go in, and it's a beautiful setting at the end of a dirt road in the woods. Um, and these folks have taken such great care to preserve uh, this home for posterity. And if you're ever in New, uh, New England, I would recommend stopping in, in Tiringham, Massachusetts and uh, going to the museum. Um, so I, I spoke with them and, and basically gave them the same presentation. Um, but um, I'd like to um, cover for you a little bit about uh, the global reach of the family of William and uh, Jemima Bidwell Partridge's um, descendants. Uh, William's brother was named Oliver Partridge. He was named after their father. Um, and uh, Oliver Partridge was a doctor in, um, um, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And um, he said this about his brother's family. He said, uh, William Partridge of Pittsfield and Miss Jemima Bidwell had eight sons and four daughters, all grown and living when he died in 1836, aged 83 and a half years, but never at home, uh, never all at home together. They lived in uh, Massachusetts, New York, Missouri, Cuba, 
uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, for 40 minutes in, uh, in a 24 hour period, the sun shone on one of that family. So um, the, the family was uh, spread out across around the world. And I'd like to, to talk to you a little bit about that family. Uh, as Jed said, I've uh, been employed as a rare book, uh, or as a librarian. I worked in the rare book department at BYU for about uh, 20 years now. And back in uh, 2003, I was working with uh, one of my colleagues who was an, an Italian professor, and he was doing a lecture on almanacs as research sources. And so we were pulling together some various examples of almanacs uh, and to put in an exhibit. And uh, we had located some French and German almanacs. We decided to look at a collection of early American almanacs that we had in the book stacks there in the library uh, in special collections. And so we were back with uh, some of our colleagues, uh, library colleagues, and one of the catalogers was showing us where the American almanacs were. And my friend reached down, pulled out, a, pulled the box off the shelf, uh, pulled out a folder, and, and um, pulled out an almanac from uh, uh, 1783 or 1781 and um, started thumbing through it and he said uh, you know this this almanac has writing paper interleaved in the pages and it's been used as a diary so he said let's put that in that's a, that's a great example of how almanacs were used um, by people to write down daily occurrences so he handed it to me and I started looking through it and there was a reference to Stockbridge and I thought gee I know where at least one Stockbridge is in Western Massachusetts. It's very close to Pittsfield, where my Parkridge ancestors lived. And I turned to the first page of the writing paper, and there was a note that said, Diary of my grandfather, William Parkridge, born 1753, H.W. Parkridge. And I just had an electric shock, and I thought, gee, I could be related to this guy. So I said, Madison, my friend who had pulled the almanac out of the box, I said, Madison, I'll be right back. I'm gonna to go to my office and check something on this guy. And I went to my office and got on family search, put in the information, William Partridge, born 1753. I got a long list of hits. And I went through uh, the list of children on one of those hits and down the list, a couple of uh, uh, lines is an Edward Partridge. And I click on him and he dies in Nauvoo, Illinois in 1840. That Edward Partridge is our common ancestor. Uh, he's my third great grandfather. I don't know what he is to you folks, but I thought, gee, this is remarkable. I'm holding the diary of my fourth great grandfather. And uh, so I went back and told my friend, and he was flabbergasted that we'd been able to, to make that uh, connection uh, by accident. And after he left, I got thinking, you know, if we have one of these uh, diaries, I wonder if we have any more. So I took out all of the boxes. There were about nine boxes of these almanacs. And I went through the, uh, the, some 200 almanacs in those boxes. I found 45 more that were written, had marginal notes. And, and as I came to, uh, come to, came to find out, 43 of those were in William's handwriting. Two were, I think, in his son's handwriting, John, uh, Edward's brother. And I thought, this is so amazing. And of all of those 43 or 45 almanacs, the only one with William Partridge's name on it was the one my friend pulled out of the box. If, if we hadn't had that as the key to unlock this mystery, we never would have known anything about William Partridge, the father of Edward Partridge, the first bishop of the church. Well, let me tell you something about uh, uh, William Partridge. And, but first, before we go to that, let me, let me give credit to H.W. Partridge, the grandson who made that note in uh, that almanac. So H.W. is on the right. That's Harvey Williams Partridge. His father is John Partridge. Um, who's on the left. John is Edward's brother. Um, these were, uh, John was a farmer in Pittsfield. H.W. Uh, was a businessman. And he was the keeper of the family history. 
uh, and accumulated a lot of information, but his, um, his children predeceased him, so he didn't have anybody to pass uh, any kids to pass um, these almanacs on, and, and any other family information onto. So uh, those materials went to, um, as best as I can figure out, uh, a nephew and um, Harvey Hinman Partridge, who was, uh, came to be a corporate executive, I think with a rubber company in Ohio. But, um, so I'm not exactly sure how these almanacs came to BYU, but they were not associated with Edward's family ever. So it was uh, an amazing uh, discovery to find these. So m not much was known about um, William Partridge, uh, and one of, uh, one of our relatives uh, made this comment. Um, very little is known of him. He, like his grandfather Edward, did not become very active in the community. At least there is no record of it. Well, these diaries give us some record of, of uh, William's uh, life. Um, he was perhaps uh, uncomfortable in, pub in a public life, but he was uh, um, a force in the community and people looked up to him. Um, when I found all of these diaries, I figured that someone was expecting that I would transcribe them and annotate them. So that's, that's been a project that I've worked on for the past 15 years, trying to add some life uh, to these uh, very brief entries usually that William made in these diaries. Uh, William was the son of Colonel Oliver Partridge. Uh, he was a Yale graduate and um, he was a military commander, a politician. He was uh, given the title of uh, rank colonel because of his service in the French and Indian War. Um, he was uh, represented Massachusetts at the Albany Congress of 1754 and at the Stamp Act Congress of 1765, where he supported resistance to the British Stamp Act. Uh, William's mother was Anna Williams, daughter of Reverend William Williams of Weston, Massachusetts, and Hannah Stoddard. Um, and according to David Dudley Field, a uh, historian of um, the Pittsfield area, he said that William and his brother John, who's shown here uh, on the left of the photograph, or the slide, uh, settled in Pittsfield in the spring of 1780. Uh, and they settled uh, in a location north and of the east branch of the Housatonic River near the Dalton uh, city or town line. Uh, today, if you go there, is uh, their home uh, was at the intersection of Partridge Road, appropriately named, and Crane Avenue. Uh, a modern home now replaces the home that uh, the homes that were there at the time. Um, Colonel Oliver Partridge was responsible for uh, doing the surveying of uh, much of Western Massachusetts, and so he picked out. Um, a, a good spot for his boys to settle on. In fact, William said uh, uh, Potter, and he referred to his father Oliver as uh, Potter, the Latin term for father, and his brother Oliver as Frater, the Latin term for brother. So um, uh, he said Potter uh, purchased brother John and my farm, and that was in uh, 1781. And um, so there were a number of entries in the early diaries about uh, William working um, as a hired hand for other uh, farmers in the area, for him uh, working in his own fields. But one day, October 6, 1781, he made this entry, I played. And uh, he didn't say what he did when he played, but you might be interested to know that in 1791, uh, the town of Pittsfield enacted an ordinance prohibiting any game of wicket, cricket, baseball, bat ball, football, cats, fives, or any other game played with a ball within 80 yards of the town meeting house. So maybe William was one of those early baseballers in Pittsfield, Mass. Uh, it's, it's not clear that William served in the Revolutionary War. I suspect he did not. Uh, I found a note in one of the early diaries, seven, uh, diary for 1782, um, that I think was a note given uh, to William by a local recruiter for the Revolutionary Forces. It said, Mr. Partridge, as you are in Mr. Merrill's class, I think of 
it of importance that you convey the list to him as soon as possible. People are picking up the news and you may lose a chance by delay. I am your humble servant, uh, W. Little. And Woodbridge Little was um, at first a Tory and then he changed uh, his uh, allegiance and became a recruiter for the Continental Army. And he added this postscript to this uh, little note. Moses Bartlett, I am told, means to go into the army. So he's kind of prodding William a little bit. Why don't you go as well and have uh, stories to tell for your grandkids? Well, William apparently did not. He and his brother John um, were busy, and entries indicate that they were building uh, a home that John eventually would live in. And on December 11th, uh, 1782, uh, William made this entry. John and I moved to his house to live and have wid widowed them as a housekeeper. Uh, there are some frustrating gaps in William's record keeping. We don't have, uh, we're, we're missing some of the diaries, uh, some of the almanacs, so we don't have uh, all of the information about his courtship to Jemima Bidwell, to whom he was married in uh, 1787. But it, I assume that in the course of um, the, the years uh, after John's home was built, he and his brother worked on a home for William, and eventually he had a home that he could um, show off to his prospective wife because um, the father-in-law was a congregational minister in Tiringham, so he had to, uh, and this was the oldest daughter in the family, so he had to be able to prove that he could sustain a family and, and uh, live a, a respectable life. The first mention that William makes of his wife is, um, in, on January 26, 1789, when he writes, uh, went with my wife to Tiringham. Uh, the first home uh, was no doubt a wooden structure, but William had great aspirations. And on August 23rd, 1803, he writes, uh, began to make brick. And so his uh, goal was to build a brick home for his wife and family. On December uh, 7th and 8th, uh, 1819, so 16 years later, he makes this entry. Uh, he spent those two days counting bricks. He had 40,000 bricks. <laughs> um, and by uh, 1821, he was getting ready to build. Uh, on June 18th, 19th, and 20th of that year, uh, he spent digging the cellar for that home. And in July, he began to lay bricks. And then on December 22nd, he said, I moved into the brick house. That's the brick house. Um, it's an impressive uh, building. Uh, no longer stands there. It was torn down about 1899. It was the second brick building in, or second brick home in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, he was 68 years old when he moved into that home. And I, the older I get, I'm, I'm four years older than that. I, uh, I'm amazed that at that age he was had. Uh, uh, that project uh, uh, in front of him and that he completed it, actually. Yeah. Um, in 1826, a tragic accident happened, and on September 30th, William writes, my wife's left, left eye crushed, and that's the best reading I can make of that word, and that's probably the only word in all, all of those diaries that I can't really make out all that well. But um, by putting things together, um, Jemima apparently had an accident that resulted in total blindness, and I'll talk to you um, a little bit later about that. Uh, there's some, some other clues. Um, William died in, on October 28th, 1836, and uh, the death notice in the Pittsfield Sun uh, said this, died in this town on Friday, Mr. William Partridge, aged 83, one of our oldest and most esteemed citizens. And Jemima Bidwell Partridge died on January 28, 1842. Her obituary read, died in this town on Friday last, Mrs. Partridge, relict of Mr. William Partridge, age 77. So William's diaries reveal um, uh, glimpses of what his life was like and the lives of his children. Uh, they traveled far from that uh, brick home that you see there, that cozy home. And uh, probably it would be helpful for me to do just a little geolocating of, these, of this family as they dispersed around the world. Um, the, the oldest son was Williams, uh, born, and that's a plural, that's the family surname that he had.
Grant as his first name. Um, he was born in 1788, and he died in Onondaga Hill, New York, in 1866. Oliver was born in 1789, and he died in Pittsfield in 1860. Emily was born in 1791. She married the Reverend uh, Joseph Warren Dow, who was a minister in Cheringham, and uh, she died in 1885 in Chicago. Edward, of course, was born in 1793. Uh, he married Lydia Clisby, and he died uh, in Nauvoo, Illinois in 1840. Uh, Mercy, the next uh, child, was born in 1795. She married the Reverend uh, Samuel Whitney and died in Waimea, Hawaii in uh, 1872. Maria um, married, born in 1797, married Harvey Brewer and died in Pittsfield in 1866. It's said that she and her husband were missionaries in Smyrna, Turkey uh, for a period. Uh, Pamela was born in 1799. She was unmarried. She died as well in Onondaga Hill, New York in 1841. Samuel, um, the next child, born in 1801, uh, died in Bedford, Michigan in 1880. John, uh, born in 1803, uh, had two wives, Nancy Chandler and Harriet Jane Wheeler, and he died in Pittsfield in 1870. And George Washington was born in 1805. Uh, he married Mary Lopez, and they lived in Cuba. At least uh, um, William makes reference to him visiting uh, the family in 1835 uh, from Cuba. Cotton Mather was born in 1805, and he died in uh, Pecatonica, Illinois, and James Harvey, the youngest, was born in 1810, and he died in Cranford, New Jersey. He was an educator in New York City. Uh, he died in 1895. So the, the children uh, that perhaps had the biggest impact on uh, the groups that they are associated with were Edward and Mercy. So I'd like to talk to you a, a little bit about uh, those two. So Edward Partridge, uh, this is a plate that appears in, appeared in the Contributor magazine. So if you wonder where the, what the source of this is, that's the, the only image I know of Edward. Um, he uh, was born on August 27, 1793. Uh, William writes in his diary, my third son born. Uh, they don't name their kids apparently right away, so they wanted to see, I guess, what their personalities were like before they associated a name with them. Uh, the first reference to Edward by name in William's diaries is in uh, February, uh, on February 20th, 1810, when William says, Edward to Lanesboro to live with the Grosvenor. By Grosvenor was a local hatter. Edward was uh, going there to uh, Lanesboro, which is a nearby community, to uh, begin his four-year apprenticeship. Um, Following his apprenticeship, uh, Edward went to New York State, uh, where he worked as a salesman for Asa Marvin, uh, a hatter, and he also went into business with Marvin in Clinton, a town near uh, Albany. In 1817, he moved to Painesville, Ohio, to open a branch of their hatting and enterprise, and in 1819, he married Lydia Clisby. Their children were Eliza Maria, uh, born in 1820, Harriet. Pam Pamela or Pamelia in 1822, Emily Dow in 1824, Caroline Ely, that's, she's my third, uh, second great grandmother. So Caroline Ely descendants, I know Jed is, okay. Um, she was born in 1827. There was a baby boy who died at, at birth, uh, Lydia born in 1830, and Edward Jr. born in 1833. So we've got Edward Jr. descendant here too. Yes. Um, so uh, Edward was a successful businessman uh, in Painesville. Um, he was the uh, treasurer of Painesville uh, for several years. He was a supervisor of roads. And uh, from contemporary newspaper accounts, uh, his heading um, business seemed to be a meeting place for the community. There's at least one reference to uh, a group meeting there to talk about building a school uh, for uh, the community. 
Uh, in his business dealings, he gained a reputation for honesty and good judgment. And in 1830, you're probably acquainted with the story that four missionaries visited his uh, adding establishment to, to talk about this new religion, and the book is called the Book of Mormon, associated with the restoration of this, uh, the gospel of uh, Christ. And uh, Edward told them he did not believe what they said, but believed they were imposters and sent them away. Well, he had second thoughts. So he sent one of his workers after them and bought one of their books. Well, the missionaries um, were very successful in uh, preaching in the Painesville area. Uh, at least one local minister, Sidney Rigdon, a Campbellite preacher, um, uh, offered to let them preach in his um, church. And um, Edward and Lydia were part of that congregation, and Lydia was immediately taken up with uh, the message of the gospel. And so was Sidney. They both uh, were baptized. Edward, however, uh, was not convinced. He, uh, he wanted uh, more, uh, some more information. It's not like Edward was an agnostic. Uh, he records that as a child, um, uh, that he had often the Spirit of the Lord move upon him, insomuch that my heart was made tender and uh, went and wept and sometimes uh, went silently and poured out the effusions of my soul to God in prayer. So uh, Edward was convinced that it was absolutely necessary for God to reveal himself to a man uh, to man and confer authority upon one or more before his church could be built up in the latter days. And he wanted to find out if Joseph Smith was the man who uh, would fit that description. So he didn't want to wait for the spring. And in uh, December of 1830, he and Sidney Rigdon went to New York to do some more investigating. They were charged by the members of the community to bring back a report of what they found about uh, this new religion and the founder. Uh, <clears throat> by December 10th, they had visited the Smith family farm in Manchester and observed a tidy farmstead, talked to the neighbors, and uh, uh, had good reports on everything except the subject of religion, uh, which the neighbors uh, did not agree with the Smiths on. Uh, but the Smiths had moved away, and they were living in um, Waterloo, New York, and so Sydney and Edward went to Waterloo to visit the family. Uh, they found Joseph preaching in a meeting, and so they slipped in uh, to listen to the preaching. At the end of the meeting, they went up, and uh, Edwards uh, committed that he wanted to be baptized because of the reports that he had, or because of what they had seen in Manchester and the reports that they had received from uh, the neighbors regarding uh, the, um, the good um, citizenship and ambition of the Smith family. Uh, no doubt the day was uh, well spent, and so uh, Joseph uh, said, let's do it tomorrow. So on December 11th, 1830, uh, Edward was baptized and ordained um, and, and given that priesthood authority that he was so longing to uh, discover. And Joseph asked him to go on a mission to his family and take the, the gospel message to them. So on December 23rd, William writes in his diary, Edward came here. Uh, he didn't say what the nature of Edward's visit was. Uh, I think we know uh, what Edward must have told his family. And on January 3rd, William writes, Edward and Cotton, that's uh, Edward's brother, went to Tiringham, and on January 5th they returned. Um, Tiringham was where his sister Emily was living. Edward did not find a receptive audience with his family. Uh, he said uh, in 1834, when I was last at, at mass um, almost four years ago, some of my relatives, as I have been informed, thought me somewhat deluded, for I, I know, think the same of me yet. And that's putting it mildly, because Emily, uh, according to one of Edward's daughters, said, uh, uh, Emily, his sister, said uh, they pronounced him crazy, and one of his sisters, that must have been Emily, uh, said she never wanted to see him again, and so he was forced from her home. Uh, well, uh, Edward 
was uh, intent to return back to Ohio to his family. His family in Massachusetts was concerned about his welfare. They thought he had really gone off the rocker uh, with joining the Mormon church. And so they sent the youngest brother, Harvey, James Harvey, uh, with Edward to accompany him back. And on January 11th, William writes, Edward returned home, Harvey with him. Um, Edward was no doubt happy to have his brother um, attend uh, uh, with him as a traveling companion. And that's an image of James Harvey. Uh, that's his obituary. So uh, according to, uh, well, um, they, they returned to, to New York first and found that the saints were on the move, on the move to Kirkland because of the su success of the missionaries there. There was a, a large congregation and there was growing persecution in New York. So uh, they decided uh, to head west. And uh, it, um, two months after he had left his family, Edward returned home. Um, Harvey stayed with them uh, for almost six months, and William writes in his diary on uh, July 14th, uh, 1831, Harvey got home from the West. Harvey, in the meantime, had joined the church, but apparently did not uh, tell his family that he had done so, uh, because he was always had good relations with his family in Massachusetts and elsewhere. He was the only person uh, in the family that Edward could communicate through. Uh, so, uh, James Harvey was kind of a key uh, player for Edward for the rest of his life. Uh, Edward, as you know, was called to be a bishop of the church, and uh, one of the challenges of, of uh, that early church assignment was to deal with uh, the law of consecration and the lands that were being given, turned over to the church, and then turned back to the members for their use. Uh, there were some uh, uh, learning experiences that he and Joseph had as they came to understand what the Lord uh, wanted them to do in regards to the law of consecration. And uh, basically, uh, the challenge was there were too many people and not enough resources. And as they tried to uh, make that law work in uh, Kirtland with the incoming uh, new members of the church coming into the area, there just weren't, there wasn't enough land. And so,